Ladies and gentlemen, let's do something a little bit different this week. Let's do a little fun project. What's going to happen is today, we're going to be coding a particle system from scratch. And what's going to happen is I'm going to walk you through the process and hopefully you learn something or at least, you know, if you're an experienced programmer, you'll probably just take a fun break from the rest of the things you are doing. Without further ado, let us jump right into writing a particle system after the break. Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. So today we'll be writing a particle system from scratch. But before we begin, there are a few things that you probably need to take note of. First and foremost, this is going to be very much of an oversimplification. Not everything is going to be perfect in this implementation. And in particular, the physics itself is actually sort of fake. I mean, I've done proper particle systems in school and you actually have to do things like Euler integration and that sort of stuff to make sure the movement is sort of as you would expect. We're not going to do any of that here. We're going to take a very simplified approach to the movement of the particle. So just understand that. Several points in the program are also not perfectly efficient, but well, like I said, this is just a fun project. What I expect to get at the end of it is a basic skeleton that you can then tweak, you know, you can then change things up and optimize to sort of suit your liking. To follow along with this tutorial, you will need a programming language that supports object-oriented programming, or OOP for short. The vast majority of modern day programming languages do this. You know, as long as you're not using C, you are probably fine. Your programming language also needs to be able to draw things on screen and you need to be familiar with both your programming language as well as that drawing capability because of course I will not be going into specifics about that. Personally, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking a web programming approach to this. In other words, I will be creating an HTML5 canvas, I'll be powering it with JavaScript and the whole thing will run in browser. JavaScript does confer several advantages when used this way. Most prominently of all is in its simplicity. I mean, I've used several programming languages to implement a particle system and my JavaScript approach is the one that has the least code. So yeah, if you're not quite sure what programming language you'd like to use and you happen to be able to do JavaScript, then yeah, it will be best to do that since that's what I'm doing as well. So let's begin. Our first step is actually something I cannot help you with. Essentially, what you need to do for this step is to set everything up. This mostly involves just creating a shell of a GUI. If you're writing this in, say, Java, you know, you have to prepare your J frames and your J panels. For me, what I'm doing is I'm creating a blank HTML page containing nothing but just a canvas element. Step two, let's now jump into the bulk of the work by preparing the particle class. As mentioned, this is going to be an OOP solution. And what that means is we begin by forming our object. In this case, our object is a particle object. Every one of the particles you see at the end of the day would be one instance of the particle object. And that is how we make things, you know, easier to scale and yet very easy to manage. So what are the attributes of a particle? Obviously, you need to know where it is on a grid. Therefore, we need two parameters, an X and Y position. Then we need to know how the particle will move. And therefore, we add another two parameters for X and Y velocity. On top of that, I do actually have an additional attribute called did. This is just a Boolean flag telling us whether the particle should be killed off. In my case, a particle will despawn when it leaves the boundary of the image. So yeah, once the particle leaves the boundary, it becomes dead. And I will write something later on to delete all dead particles. Obviously, you don't have to do things this way, but it's probably smart to have, you know, a way to flush out the older particles. Otherwise, of course, your list of particles is just going to get longer and longer, and you don't want that. With the attributes in place, let us now take a look at the methods. Of course, for any OOP solution, you will need a constructor. In my case, the constructor is extremely simple. It takes in the four parameters that will feed into the four attributes as we've seen earlier. The dead flag is set to false by default. Moving on, our next method is called advance. The whole idea of advance is, 
well, every time you're done drawing all the particles at their current position, you want to move them forward to their next position and then draw it again so the particles appear to have moved. All the advanced function needs to do is it needs to take the current position of the particle and then add the current velocity to the position. This moves it forward by the amount as specified by the velocity. My advanced method also checks to see if the particle actually leaves the window at any point of time. If it does, then we set dead to true. So that means a particle is dead if it leaves the window. Once again, you don't have to do this, but you're recommended to do so. Next, an accelerate function. This is meant to be called outside of the particle system, and this is what I use to implement gravity. All you need to do to accelerate a particle is to simply add the acceleration to the velocity. Like I said, this is not meant to be physically correct. Obviously, if you're a physicist, you're probably cringing right now, but this will look okay. Seriously, trust me. Next up, we have an accessor called is dead. This simply returns the Boolean value of the dead variable. Finally, we have a draw function. Now, this may be optional or may be implemented very differently depending on how your programming language actually draws things on screen. Pass whatever parameters you need into the function. In my particular case, I do have to pass a graphics drawing context to the function. So yeah, just check and make sure you have what you need. And that's it for step two. What we've done is we've created a fully blown particle class that we're ready to throw into an animation with other instances of the particle class, and we will see our particle system in action. Step three is a short one. All you need to do in this stage is to prepare a data structure to hold all your particles. Now, there is one challenge here, and that is the fact that the number of particles will not be constant. So what you need to do is you need to find a data structure in your programming language that can scale in size. If you're using something like Java, you know, an array list or a vector would do just fine. In my case, I would just be using an array. JavaScript arrays are not limited to a certain length, so I'll be just fine. Step four is our main loop. Now, I call this a loop even though the way I'll be doing it does not involve a loop at all. Anyway, the whole point of this is to have basically your main body of code to be run at an interval. For the vast majority of programming languages, basically what you'll be doing is just a loop ending with a sleep or wait statement. Essentially, you run everything, you wait for an interval, and then you go back and you run everything again. If we remove the wait, obviously things will happen as fast as your computer can handle it, and what you end up with is a particle system that moves really quickly. That's why we throw in a sleep or wait to slow things down. Like I said, not perfect, but well, we'll have to make do for this very basic implementation. Of course, in JavaScript, there isn't such a problem because all I need to do is to do the set interval function and that will, you know, do some clever method of scheduling that particular function to run. Whatever it is, you will need some method of triggering your main body of code at an interval. So what is in the main body of code? Well, simply three loops doing the following. Spawn, advance, and render. In your spawning loop, all you're doing is you're creating new particles. So obviously, you know, however many particles you want, you want to loop that number of times, instantiate that number of particles, and then add them to your list of particles. I would recommend giving these particles a randomized velocity. If you want things to move in a general direction, then give it a base velocity, and then add a small random offset to that value. That is of course important if you have everything at the same velocity, then they'll all just travel in a line, and that's not very interesting to look at. So if you have a randomized velocity, things will start to spray at an angle, and then you'll have that stylistic look. So now that we're done with the spawn loop, let us move on to the advanced loop. Now, my advanced loop actually does two things. First of all, of course, is to run the advanced function on every single instance of particle. But the thing is, once you've run the advanced function, there is a possibility for some of the particles to end up dead. And once they're dead, we would of course want to remove them. There is a small challenge of removing things from an array while looping through the array. For example, if I was going from 1 to 10, and then at 5, I removed 5, 
and then in my next iteration I moved on to 6. The problem is when I've done the removal, everything sort of collapses inwards. Therefore, essentially what I've done is I've ended up skipping one element in the list. And you don't want to do that, you want to make sure you look at everything. The way to achieve this is to actually do this from the end of the list and basically decrement your way backwards. Because you see, if you do that and you delete an element, it doesn't matter. In your next step, you're going back by one. And regardless of whether you've deleted anything, you will always land up in the correct place. So yeah, for this particular portion, this is important. You'll want to do your for loop in reverse. Of course, this would be a non-issue if you're using a language like Java. Java actually implements iterators, and when you have that, you can safely delete things as you're iterating through a list. In my particular use case in JavaScript, I don't seem to have that luxury, so too bad. Loop through your list of particles, call the advanced function, then check to see if the particle is dead. If it is, remove it from the list. This would probably also be a good time to call add velocity to add gravity to your simulation. Moving on to our render loop, we loop through all the particles again, and then simply call the draw function on each particle. This will of course draw your entire particle system on screen. Of course, you'll need to tweak this up depending on how drawing works in your programming language. You may also face the trouble of having basically all your particles start stacking on top of each other and a moving particle creates a trail. What's happening in that case is simply, you know, every iteration just stacks on top of each other. You'll need to clear the screen before the next iteration. So just bear that in mind. And that is actually it. If you run the program, you know, fingers crossed you don't have any bugs, you should actually have a simple particle system going. With any luck, the whole implementation and debugging shouldn't take more than half an hour. This is of course highly dependent on your skill level, but it should be a reasonably lightweight task. So what you should end up with at this point is an extremely simple particle system. But more importantly, what you should have is an extremely extendable particle system. And that is the most important part. Moving forward from this point, the possibilities are quite endless. Now, what I like to do is I like to first refactor out all the constant values because of course we have quite a few of those in our program. Once you've moved all the constants to the top of your program, what you can do is you can basically tweak the values and then run to see you know, what's the effect on that. It's always nice to move the emitter around, uh, change the velocity so that you know, the spray pattern is different, just to explore what your program can do. Don't forget you can tweak the gravity as well and then you can have you know, no gravity sort of simulations, whatever you like really. And tweaking the constants is just the tip of the iceberg. If you go in to modify the code, you can add many features. For example, maybe you like to change the color of the particles. Maybe you like to change their size. If you add them as attributes, they can be different from particle to particle. What about mouse interactivity? What about having little motion trails, like streaks? Incidentally, the way you do this is instead of just holding the current position of the particle, you'll also have to remember the previous position. When you render the particle, instead of just drawing a point, draw a line from the previous position to the current position. Obviously, when you do your advanced step, you will need to remember to advance both the current position and the previous position as well. If you implement that correctly, you'll get nice little streaks like this. What are some of the other crazy things you can do? I mean, you probably have more ideas than I have, but what about collision? What about little effectors that will change the positions of particles? Hell, the last time I did this project, I broke everything up and what I ended up with was a little modular system that allowed me to add more particle emitters, it allowed me to add effectors, you know, basically you can have a full-blown particle system that can be very carefully customized. So yeah, I hope you had a fun exercise, I hope you now have a crazy particle system on your hands that you have customized to whatever extent you like. Well, that's all there is for this particular episode. I hope you had fun, that's the most important thing here. I hope you tried this and you enjoyed yourself. Because really, that's the best way to learn how to code. To enjoy yourself, to experiment, and to see the results. 
that's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.